Hey everyone, I just got back from Geekway to the West. Well, no, it's been a couple weeks since that, but that doesn't make for a compelling video. This is going to be a little recap of my experience at Geekway to the West. This Geekway to the West, four days of peace, love, and board games. What a lovely tagline. And you know what? I really agree with that. There are 350 days, 12 hours, and 50 seconds left for <laughs> until the next Geekway to the West. May 15th through May 18th, 2025, and it is something that I, I really hope to be attending. I went there on behalf of the World Series of Board Gaming, which, if you don't know, I do some work for them. I was running a little mini qualifier, and I did a Vegas WSPG-specific vlog that you should be able to find over on the World Series of Board Gaming's YouTube channel. I'll link that down below. And while you're there, go subscribe so that like, my numbers go up, because it's just me over there just me. You're going to get a bunch of news content and then you're going to get stuff that I actually want to create, like strategy guides and some playthroughs. And I've got a playthrough of Heat with Asger, half of the design team of Heat that's coming up on multiple channels. Anyway, go go subscribe to that. Doesn't matter. So I'm not going to talk too much about my WSBG experience because if you want to hear about that, of course, it will be peppered in in terms of how I perceived the event, working most of the event. But I'm going to just talk about the vibe of Geekway. And if you are in the St. Louis area, St. Louis, Missouri, I would really, really highly recommend going to this event. It was lovely. It was absolutely lovely. And it was a lot more lovely than I was expecting it to be, honestly. I didn't quite know what to expect. I saw this picture on their website. I, I had seen... Um, this Tom Vassell's vlog traveling to Geekway, and I think it's in a similar spot. Maybe not. Maybe it's a bit different. But I just knew it was a board gaming convention and like a game focused convention, right? Having never been to Missouri, I didn't know what to expect, but it was really, really well run. And uh, it was a really nice, chill atmosphere with a great flow of the event for sure, at least from what I saw. And I got to play a couple really fun games too which worked out really well. Shout out to everybody who played games with me. I really appreciate it. Because for the most part, I was running the WSBG event. So I flew in on, let me check my calendar, Wednesday. I flew in on Wednesday the 15th. Geekway ran from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It shut down Sunday around 6. And it got going like Thursday morning, Thursday at like 9 or 10. Because my events were midday Thursday, midday Friday, and then morning, afternoon, Saturday, and then Sunday morning. So I had events for most of that time. And I'll throw in some B-roll of Geekway, of the WSPG vlog, just so you know, you have a little bit more of a visual. It, it, essentially, there were two main gaming hall areas. There was one large gaming hall, and then where I was, uh, just outside of a secondary gaming hall area, there was uh, another smaller one. And I, I quite liked that they were both. It always felt like there were enough tables, which is pretty important. And then outside of those open gaming areas, there was one space that was designated solely for events. There was a section for a vendor hall. And then there were a bunch of offshoot quiet rooms. And then in the hotel itself, it seemed like every floor, there were some offshoot rooms as well where people could bring their games and, and play. So if there was some overflow, I think they were not necessarily tight for tables, but they had a lot of people. It was probably like 3,000 people. But it was spread out in a way that it, it didn't feel like there were that many people. And the open gaming area was fairly large. Like it was it was very clear where you were going to go for open gaming. They also had outside uh, a couple of people demoing some games. Uh, Apostocracy, which was on Kickstarter during the crowdfunding countdown of when I was there. Uh, I was able to go down and see a, a demo of it. So I didn't have to read that rule book to know how to play it which was great for me because I was tired and I just needed one thing off of my checklist. They also had a huge play to win section. I think that was one of the main draws to Geekway, or at least when I, I was speaking to the organizers about it, uh, they said our play to win is, is what kind of what we're known for in terms of, of other events other than open gaming. And so there were a bunch of copies in there and they had very strict rules in terms of making sure people can't game the system. The problem with play to win titles, if you don't know, at a convention, you can go to a convention, you can pull out a title, you can play it, you can return it, and then you're entered into a draw to win that game. It's great for publishers because it encourages more people to play their games. It's great for attendees because you have a chance to win those games. It's really great for everybody all around, I feel. Those are the games that get played the most at conventions, hands down. Like, 
if you're a publisher, you put in five, 10 copies of your games, it's going to be played by, I don't know, hundreds of people, right? And a lot of people who are who have never played it before. For example, one of the games that I played, Darwin's Journey, which I'll talk about the games that I played in a second, uh, which and it was great. That was pulled out. People were setting it up. They didn't know how to play. We just learned from the rule book. And so you'll get a lot of people who are interested in it, trying it out, and then seeing if they win. And Geekway was really great because they announced at the very end, they said, okay, play to win has happened. Also, we're smart board gamers, you dumb idiots. And we're able to analyze the data. If you took out a play to win, and you held it for 12 hours, guess what? You're not being entered into the draw for the play to win. And so I think that really helps eliminate a lot of bad actors and just gets people to try out the games in the spirit of what the play to wins are intending. Because people who take away and try to game the system, that doesn't work for the publishers, that doesn't work for other players, and that's just a scummy thing to do. If you're one of those people, you're a scummy human. You are. <laughs> so get better. This is your chance to get better. It's like everybody five friends would take out a play to win and then they'd all put it back and log as if they'd played it five times no you're not being entered into the play to win uh, another thing that i really loved about geekway is that they had a pa system now it was too loud but it was really great to be able to communicate things to the entire convention center and that's one thing that i've never seen i find conventions is hard to communicate announcements right? Because you're so spread out and just having access to that internal PA system was really, really good. I do love that at the beginning, the very beginning, the first announcement, it was the perfect volume. Oh, it was so good. It was absolutely perfect. And then somebody told him to speak louder. And you heard him say, are you sure? Because I've gotten complaints before that I'm too loud. So I'm trying to modify that. Okay, I guess I'll turn it up. And then it was obnoxiously loud <laughs> for the rest of the event. But at least it cut through the noise, right? Like, I understand why it has to be that loud to cut through the noise, etc. Anyway, so I did mostly my WSBG event. Uh, thanks to everybody who was there who participated. And it was just a free event that I was running at Geekway. And so the prize was just like a single ring ticket. And I did two at the same time. I brought all my games in Ziploc bags. And I ran the event. Everybody who I engaged with there was just really, really lovely. Uh, but also, when I was done, I had some filming to do. I wasn't able to capitalize on open gaming as much as I, I wanted to, but I did still play some games. So I'm going to talk about those right now. Starting off with an incredible game, 2009. Oh, I thought it was, I thought it was older. I thought it was 20 years old, but it's only 15 years old. Uh, Hansa Teutonica is so good. Like 132. Wow. Of course it's 132 on Board Game Geek. Here I thought I was like this little hidden gem. Well, it's not a hidden gem. I know it's been around for a while, but Hansa Teutonica is just exceptional. We played the big box, but we played on this main map, and it's so simple to play. It's a cutthroat game of action efficiency. You get two actions on your turn until you improve those actions. And those two actions are essentially putting a cube down in one of these spots or completing a route. If you complete a route where you have all of your cubes laid down, you get to drop your cube on one of these trading posts. The more trading posts you have, the more points you're probably going to have. But if you complete a trait, but if you complete a route in one of these five sections or six sections on the board over here, you get to upgrade your efficiency. So down here at this corner of the map with these letters, you get to improve your actions. So you can take three actions a turn. And then up here, you get to improve the spots on which you can place things. You can only start on white and then you get onto orange, et cetera, et cetera. Over here, you get to improve how many workers you refresh because when you use them they all go back into a, a side section over here you get to improve how many circle workers you have because they're special and they can block a lot of stuff and then down here you get to improve points right and so all of these spots all of these spaces are really important to lock down to improve your own player board which is sitting down here they have cubes on them you want to unlock those certain things but you're never going to be able to do everything in addition Anytime somebody completes a route where you have a little post, you get a point. So do you complete routes early? Do you complete it for the bonus? Do you go there when somebody else has completed it? And do you just focus on your own thing? We played with five players and that feels like the best player count for sure because there was so much interaction. It is such a tense game, especially because you can see these two red cubes. I could drop my green cube down there and red would never be able to finish that route. They never would be able to unless they push me out of there. 
and pushing me out of there costs them action efficiency, it costs them an extra cube, and it lets me get spouted out over here and I get to drop an additional cube out there. So you want to be pushed out. The whole game revolves around you getting into each other's way and just like messing up plans for everyone. And that's why at five players, it's really, really good because you have that ability to just to just screw each other over the whole time. It, it was so good. Like, it is so, so good. It is so simple. It is just cubes and a few discs, but it is exceptional. I played with, again, I played with five people, lovely, lovely people. And how I found it is I, I just walked around. I looked for those player players wanted signs. These are so integral at any game playing convention. You stick a little thing down and then people who are solo can just wander around and be like, oh, you're starting a game. Perfect. I'll sit down and we'll do it. And so we waited. The two of us waited. And then three of his friends who we had met earlier on joined up a little bit later with us. And we just chilled and chatted for like 20 minutes. And I was like, oh, man, what a surprise. I can hang out with anybody here because they're all board gamers. So Hansa Teutonica was awesome. Again, another game that was awesome that I'm super happy I got to try is Darwin's Journey. Oh, look, they're so close to each other on VGG. Hansa's 132. And Darwin's Journey is 130. Wow. Darwin's Journey is, again, a really great game. I don't know which one I like more, uh, Hansa or Darwin's Journey. They both scratch a different itch. The Darwin's Journey up here, let's see, let's just zoom in a little bit more. Darwin's Journey is a worker placement game where you slowly develop your workers into unique workers. So you can see a lot of these spaces up here, This where they require colors, these little spaces over here, these little circles. You need like a blue color over here. You need yellow color over here. You need red color over here. And then when you get over to this way, you need like blue and red or yellow and green. And sometimes you need multiples of those colors. And that's because everybody has a board like this. And on this left side is where your workers would sit. And this shows what your workers can do. So the worker that is at this spot can do two blue, two red and two purple, which are wild things. So they've developed that worker into a really efficient purple and red worker with some flexibility. Here, they haven't developed that worker yet. They can only go to red spaces. Here, they can go to yellow or green spaces or a combination of the two. And so you're developing this player board, which shows what your workers can do. Up here, you don't have to worry about it. Those are objectives that you complete, which can give you special one-time bonuses or permanent bonuses. Also fun to kind of specialize yourself as you go across this journey. In addition, going back to this photo, you are going to be traveling down below on this map. You can see these workers are started here. They're going to progress along the map, picking up these species, the knowledge of how these species were created, and also unlocking different bonuses. There are tents you can put down for bonuses. Uh, a lot of this has to do with chaining your actions together. This one action will let you put envelopes down, which will let you move your people, which will let you move your boat. But essentially, there's just different variable tracks that you can move up and down on that will chain together, if you want to think about it in that way. When you collect your species, you can then research them and uncover them here, where you get money if you're early on, and you'll get points if you're later on. And I thought, why would I ever do it early on? And then I realized, oh, I have no money. Please, please, I need to research something. It is the most efficient way to get money. So yeah, really, really lovely game. Uh, again, we learned this as a three-player game straight from the rule book. We had somebody who was reading from the rule book. We had somebody who had watched a full playthrough. And then we had uh, two people who were just listening and along for the ride. I being one of those people. And man, oh man, was the most relaxing thing ever. They were like, oh, sorry, it's taking so long from the rule book. Because they all knew each other. And I just kind of sat down. I said, hey, uh, do you have room for a fourth? And they said, yep. I said, great. I was wandering the halls. They didn't have a player's wanted sign. But I just forced my way in anyway, because I knew the game and I thought it looked cool. And I saw them setting up. And so I just said, hey, is there room for me? Uh, and there was. But I said, oh, man, no, this is you don't understand. This is so relaxing to me. Uh, so that one was, again, really, really great game. Highly recommend checking it out if you can. And Renee has made me some lovely dinner, which is something I did not have while I was at Geekway. Uh, just d dinner in general. I had my bag of nuts, which is what you got to do. So I'm going to go eat that and then I'll come back to you. Okay, next game. I only played one more new game, but before that, uh, it was really nice. A couple of my players 
saw that I had some time in between uh, events that was happening. Essentially, we had the, the the event wrapped up, and then there was a four-hour break for the semifinals so players could learn their game and practice their game. Uh, and they said, hey, you're not playing anything. Do you want to play something? We tried this roll and write, and then it seemed too confusing to learn. And so they went and they grabbed Planet Unknown, which I was thrilled to play. I am excited to receive Planet Unknown. Oh, yeah, I need to add that to my list. I wrote a list of uh, what I was backing, uh, and I did not put nearly half of the games. Uh, the game found games, essentially, <laughs> on the list that I should have. But Planet Unknown is just a really, really good game. Uh, I'm super excited to add it into my collection. Uh, it, it was an okay play. I think my first play was more fun because it, it, it did end up being a little bit slower than I wanted it to. Planet Unknown is one for sure if I had would be on like the top six player board game list. Or maybe I already did that. It would be something that I would I would bring. Anyway, I love that you get your own asymmetric board and faction uh, like tech board and the tech board is always beneficial and the asymmetric planet is the thing that is difficult to navigate. Oh, it's such a good game. I think it ran a little bit long for my tastes, but uh, it was still super fun. So played that one. Uh, and then in between, or while the final was happening, the final game, I played a quick game of Brass Birmingham, a two-player game of Brass Birmingham with uh, the brother of one of the finalists who was playing Terraforming Mars. Uh, we played that, and I needed to hold my own. He he, and his brother, it was Michael and Brian, they, they played Brass, they said, six times over the weekend. They'd just gotten it. They were playing with each other. And and they wanted to play it again, and so we played a quick game of brass. Uh, I did a very good job in the first age, not as great as I would have wanted in the second age. But it was awesome just to be able to sit and and play while the Terraforming Mars game was going on. We finished before they were done, which was great. I went big cotton. I went big cotton, and I thought I could maybe do it unchecked, but I got checked a couple of times, which was disappointing to me. But I still got a lot of cotton out on the board, and it was uh, a, a quite a fun game to play. And then finally, to sort of finish up the convention, once the once the games had been all wrapped up, I met up with one of my patrons, who I didn't realize was going to be there. Because and that's a good good thing for me to now start posting on Patreon <laughs> instead of just in the room and board Patreon Discord because not everybody checks the Discord uh, of where I'm going to be at all times so that everyone can find me and come play with me. But we played Obsession. We played Obsession. Obsession is a game that I've really wanted to try for the longest time. It's been shooting up the charts. Oh, it's number 62 on Board Game Geek. And I liked it. I definitely enjoyed it. I think I like Darwin's Journey and Hansa more. Uh, so just judging by this ranking, I think those should be higher. Uh, it was definitely fun. My only qualm with Obsession is the cycling of the market. The market felt like it wasn't cycled as much as I would have liked because the objectives were sort of based all around getting specific buildings. And if you didn't see half of the buildings, then your objectives were basically worthless, right? And so people who had objectives that either the buildings came out or um weren't tied into buildings then are just able to complete those and you're sitting there going well i guess i can't complete those and you just go for points and buildings i really love in the rule book there's a whole pie chart about how you earn your points i think that's really cool but essentially the flow of the game is you pick one of these buildings you can see how they all have different uh colors on them there's two blues uh, a a white meeple, a red meeple, and a white meeple. Essentially, you need those meeples to activate them. And when you activate them, then your service goes over there because they need a friggin' break from all of your hoity toityness. And then you buy new buildings and new rooms. You also have this reputation track, which I found really interesting and exciting that these are level one buildings. So people with the reputation of level one can activate it. But later on, there might be level two buildings. You see, there's uh, some level two buildings here. Right, a level five building. So the reputation, this person's gotten their reputation to number six, uh, they would be able to use that building and you get a whole bunch more and better stuff with it. I also found we played this the standard game to 15 and I would love to try it as a 20 round game personally. I found at 15, we were just getting our reputations up into the realm where we could really do fun actions, and then the game was over. And maybe that's good, right? Sometimes you want that in an engine builder. As you chain things together, you don't ever want it to cap out and for you to be able to do everything, because then you can max out everything every round or every game. 
but I just kind of wish I got to play with the things that I worked so hard to use a little bit more. And I think the 20 round game would be able to do that. You'll have this market that's, again, like I said, I think if there was more cycle in the market, and maybe it was just how our particular buildings came out too, because there are some cycle things built in there that you cycle out the level ones and some of the other ones that you're never gonna buy later on. I think I might've liked it a little bit more. Still really enjoyed it though. I found the storytelling in it. There's no real storytelling, but every picture has its own descriptor on it. I thought the flavor text was really, really nice. And I think it's on Board Game Arena too. So I'm excited to go check that out on Board Game Arena and play it again and see if that market cycling was sort of a one-off or if it was just uh, something that I don't necessarily want to engage with. I'm also interested to see what the upstairs downstairs expansion adds potentially. Maybe when your servants are tired, they can go do other things. And so they can always do things on opposite turns. That might be fun to build out if that's a thing. I don't know. Uh, definitely enjoyable. I think I'd hype this one up in my head in terms of theme wise. I probably like Rococo slightly more engaging in that Victorian England theme. Or, the, or what I like to call Pride and Prejudice fancy dresses themes. But yeah, there was a lot, a lot, a lot to engage with. I still would rate it pretty highly, but I it wasn't tens across the board in the way that like Hansa and Darwin were. But still, really, really happy I got a chance to play it. Like so thrilled. Thanks, John, for playing with me. That was just, it was, it was awesome. It was a lovely, lovely way to finish up the the weekend in terms of my own gaming as well. So that was what I played at Geekway. That's a little bit uh, of the vibe of Geekway. What else can I tell you about Geekway? I don't know if I mentioned this or not. The hotel is the best hotel I've been in. They have an omelet bar. I said this in the WS Machine vlog too. I should probably cut it out. Honestly, I, I had to put this this little clip. I had to cut this little clip out of WSBG and you'll see why. We can take a little peek at the vendor hall. It's probably locked up, but you can see that uh, boardgametables.com. Sorry. Oh no, I can't add that. It's not this vlog. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I forgot where I was. I forgot what audience I was doing this for. And I was like, oh, okay, I can't put that in. But yeah, they had an omelet bar in, in the place. Really lovely facilities, like a really nice space and quite nicely run. I think you would still want to bring your own games. There's the play to wins, which you can engage with. And they had a library as well. The library was... Pretty good. It's always tough because I don't know how much is in the library, how much gets pulled from the library. And also, one of the libraries, one of the first libraries I was exposed to was at WSBG and at Dice Tower West, which is the Dice Tower West library, and they have like 2,500 games. So all other board game libraries seem a bit smaller in comparison, but it seemed to suit the population fine. But if you have like 3,000 people, right, you want to make sure that your library is... I don't know, maybe a thousand. And I think with the play to wins and comboed with what people brought, I don't think people were wanting for games. When I popped into the library, it seemed very full, which was nice. And so had a nice a selection of things that you could play. But I also think that people mostly brought their own games and kind of scheduled plays as well to get things off their shelf of shame. If they just happened to have dove headfirst into this hobby and bought every single thing that they saw, um changed their license plate so that it was board game related and really just do dove down the rabbit hole while Geekway seems like a really great place to bring those games and uh, get them played and get them off your shelf of shame. But yeah, highly recommend, highly, highly recommend if you're in the St. Louis area to check out Geekway next year. Everybody there was really nice. Communication seemed effective. Play to wins are always a huge plus and they had a bunch of little tournaments going on outside of WSPG as well that some people felt excited to engage with they had this thing called fancy gaming which is essentially everybody just dressed up and played board games which one of my players at wsbg tried to move their semi-final earlier so that they could go to fancy gaming and then when they it couldn't get moved so that people could have time to you know learn the game they said all right i'm out i'm going to fancy gaming so it must be good right uh, but yeah it was, it was a super super lovely time everybody who i ran into there like across the board were chill, nice, friendly people. I never got any stink eye of asking to play a game with people. 
And so it was really, really quite nice. I wish I'd seen a few more players wanted signs roaming around. When I was roaming around searching for Darwin's journey, uh, I kind of wish I'd seen more so that I could have had more of a personal selection to choose from. But then that's also silly because more players wanted sign means less people playing games. So I don't know. Uh, I just I just like seeing those flags really readily available. But I did see some of them and it worked. It got me in the game of Hansa. So that was great. But yeah, if you're looking for a chill, chill place to go, to play games, to meet other gamers. They had a big flea market as well, like a bring and buy style, which just so happened to be right beside my final table. I thought my line, I thought the line was going to be lining up in a different spot and turns out it was lining up right beside the two final tables. So that was great. Uh, that, <laughs> if I go back next year, uh, that'll have to be moved if I go back to WSPG capacity. But yeah, all in all, really lovely. If you're in the St. Louis area, go next year. Like, and you've got the you've got the free time. Definitely plan to go. I think you'll have a blast. And everybody who I met there was really nice. So can't speak more highly of it. That was a little bit of my Geekway experience. Drop down below what your favorite conventions are. What your favorite large game playing conventions are. I'm curious. I'm always curious because then I'm going to reach out on WSPG's capacity, and then maybe I can go and run an event. And then we can hang out and play some games. <laughs> really, it's very self-serving, this question. But uh, hey, <laughs> work for Geekway and work for KublaCon. If you're in the Bay Area in San Francisco, I'll have another video recap talking about KublaCon, which is coming up, you know, probably next week. But I'm separating these two so that they aren't long videos and location-based people won't care about Kubla and won't care about Geekway. Some of you may just tune in to hang out with me, in which case I appreciate you a ton, and I look forward to playing a game with you eventually. But I also wanted these to serve as resources and recommendations for the respective cons. And so for Geekway, I, I feel very, very highly about uh, everything that happened there. Hope that was helpful. Maybe I'll see you there next year.